Okay, I'm going to do a very quick intro because I have a cranky baby now. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce Melissa Lau. I know, it's exciting. Um, I had the pleasure of being a Polar Trek teacher with Melissa almost four years ago now, which is crazy how long ago it was. So I loved hearing about her expedition and I can't wait for her to tell all of you about all the cool stuff she did in Alaska. So Melissa, it's all over to you. Thank you, Lauren. And it's so nice to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity to share um, that experience that I had in 2018. That was the year that I went. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to jump right in. A lot of uh, some of the things that are on my presentation are going to be just reiterating a little bit about what you've already um, talked about with the trivia and with the climate record, um, but I think it bears repeating. It's such a important topic. Um, I am from Piedmont, Oklahoma, which is northwest of Oklahoma City, uh, so right in the center of the state, and uh, I am a high school chemistry teacher, but in a past life, I was also a middle school science teacher as well. This is actually my first year teaching high school. And um, I have learned that high schoolers are basically just, I don't know, they're, they're middle schoolers in a bigger body. Uh, they're, they're fantastic though. And I have um, loved my, uh, my job and the work that I do. And it offers me opportunities to work with organizations like Polar Trek, and uh, so I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, so just a real quick recap, uh, what climate change is. Um, again, that weather, climate versus weather, um, you know, the weather is the daily, the daily changes that we, we notice, that we feel, um, that we pay attention to because we have to decide, are we gonna be able to play outside? Do I need a coat or rain boots? Um, is it gonna be windy today? That sort of thing. Um, and then climate, Climate is the, um, the normal weather of the place. And the term normal in this case isn't, um, it, it's more of a mathematical term. Um, it's another word for average. Um, so climate can be different for different seasons. So you could have a hot and dry climate where you live in the summer, like we do here in Oklahoma. Um, you could have uh, cool and rainy winters um, and different places will have different climates. You could also live, uh, you might live where it snows all the time, or you could live where you can, you know, swim outside in February, which is not the weather that <laughs> we're experiencing right now. It's snowing here now. Um, with Earth's climate, though, it, it gets even bigger. So we can even think of climate as being local, but then we can broaden uh, and zoom out even further and talk about Earth's climate. And there's three major factors um, when we consider Earth's climate. We look at um, you know, average temperature of our planet, the average precipitation of our planet, and the average surface speed, wind speed of our planet. Um, and so our average temperature is 58 degrees Fahrenheit, 14 degrees Celsius. And so that's what happens, you know, that's the temperature of our planet when we take all of the temperature points, uh, data points across the globe and then average them out. So we have very, very cold temperatures at our poles. We can have very hot temperatures towards the equator and then more temperate in between. But when we average them all out, the average temperature of our planet is about 58 degrees. Um, our planet average precipitation is 39 inches a year or about roughly a hundred centimeters. Um, again, that's taking all of the amount of precipitation data that is collected across the globe and then just averaging those amounts out um, throughout the year. Um, and that would give us our yearly precipitation. So some places get a lot less than 39 inches. Some places get a lot more than 39 inches, but average precipitation for our planet is, is 39 inches. And then the wind speed averages out to 7.4 miles per hour. And again, other places like where I live, it can be very, very windy. Um, and then there are other places that really don't experience a lot of wind. Um, climate change is a change 
when we see the term climate change, that's referring to a change in the usual weather, the usual climate found in a place. And it could be a change in how much snow a place usually gets in a year. Um, it could be its usual temperature for a month or a season. Um, it could be like um, a phenomenon that we're experiencing is the extending of a storm season um, in Oklahoma. We typically have tornadoes in the spring and we um, are prepared for that. And we have a secondary storm season in the fall. And it's the secondary season that has caught the attention of, of the people that live around here um, because now we're suddenly getting tornadoes in the fall more often. Um, and that storm fall storm season is extending longer because it's warmer longer. Um, so we are, it's not unusual to have <laughs> in our recent uh, climate history is, you know, to have tornadoes in October and November where when I was a child growing up um, many, many moons ago, it was not nearly as common. It was so rare that you would even get a thunderstorm, much less a severe storm. So extending storm seasons is something else that, um, that we're starting to notice. Um, so climate change is also a change just, so that's more of a localized example, but climate change is also, again, talking about that global climate. Um, it's a, a, a reference to the change in the earth's average temperature. And that's typically what we think of whenever we think of climate change, we think of a, a warming of our planet, but it's also because of that warming, that's also changing where precipitation would normally fall on earth, places that are getting drier, um, other places are getting wetter. And um, so those changes are often tied to that changing temperature. And weather can change in just a few hours or days but as it was said earlier, climate is an aggregate or a, an average of many decades of weather data. And climate can take hundreds or even millions of years to, to change. And our planet has always had a, a changing climate. And it was mentioned in the trivia um, game that there have been times in the past where the Earth's climate has been warmer than it is now, you know, so roughly 65 million years ago that we didn't have polar ice caps. Um, our planet was much warmer. Um, and then there's been times when it's been a lot cooler, like in this picture with the woolly mammoths, we think of the, the fun movie Ice Age and all of the sequels um, that this would have been happening, you know, around 40,000 years ago, it was a lot cooler. And so we, our planet has these natural warming and cooling cycles. Um, and these times typically last thousands or millions of years. Um, and that is the big difference. Why is it such a big deal if it's always been happening? Um, it's the rate of change. Um, these changes are now happening within decades or a few hundred years instead of just thousands or millions of years. Um, so people who study Earth, uh, Earth's climate can see that Earth's climate is getting warmer and the Earth's temperature has gone up about one degree Fahrenheit in the last hundred years. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but when we're talking about, um, you know, that average temperature and how many data points it takes to raise an average, I always tell my students that think of the increase of the Earth's global average temperature going up, think about like you failed a test and you, how many good grades does it take to be able to pull that, that average back up if you totally bomb a test? Um, that's kind of what we're looking at here is Earth's temperature going up about one degree. Think about how much the individual data points have to increase to be able to pull that average globally up. Um, it, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of changes. Um, but these small changes in Earth's temperature has big effects. And especially when those changes, like I said, were happening in a short period of time, um, environments don't have an opportunity to adapt and and be uh, better suited for a new climate. Uh, this is a picture of Bear Glacier, which you can, uh, which is found in the Kenai Fjords uh, National Park in Alaska. 
And um, the picture that's on the left is from 2012. And the picture that is on the right is from 2019. So just seven years later, just under seven years later, um, the effects, some effects are already happening. Um, the warming of Earth's climate has caused some snow and ice to melt that would normally stay frozen year round. Um, warming has also caused our oceans to rise. So as these glaciers are melting, it's introducing land ice into our ocean systems. And that's what's causing the sea level rise. Um, it's also changed the timing when certain plants grow, which brings me to my work with Florida International University. Um, this was the group that I was um, paired up with and teamed with, uh, with Polar Trek. And um, so the team, it was a very small team, small research team. This was the bulk of us. <laughs> um, so on the, the three of us, the, the picture that's on the left, um, Dr. Jeremy May is, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but he is um, on the far left. I'm in the blue in the middle. It was raining that day or had just been raining that day. And uh, the young man with a baseball cap, well, they're both wearing caps, I guess. Um, the, the younger guy <laughs> on, the, on the right in that picture of three, he's, that's Matthew Simon, who was our undergraduate or no, our postgraduate. He was working on his master's and he was in the field with us that year. And then the lone guys crouching in the snow, taking a picture of people taking pictures. Um, that's Dr. Steve Oberbauer, who is the principal investigator. Um, he was, he is the lead of, of this research project. Um, Dr. May is the uh, postdoc that works on the program and coordinates a lot of the field work in the summer. Um, so the team at Florida International University, they study, here's their really fancy title, Phenology and Vegetation Change in the Warming Arctic. And I really had to practice really, really hard to be able to say that title um, consistently. Um, it sounds very, uh, very impressive, um, which it is, and it's very important work, but big words can often, um, you know, give you the, the impression that you can't understand something. So if we look at the term phenology, that may not be a term you're familiar with, you probably recognize the suffix of ology, which is the study of, but then pheno is literally, it means shining or appearing or seem, uh, seeming. And so phenology is the study of the timing of changes in nature. So when do, um, you know, what types of changes do we see in plants and animals in our environment that happen at different points in, in the year? Uh, so if we do a little phenology practice and you can put your answers here in the chat. So if I showed you this picture, what could you tell me about the time of year that this picture was, was taken, this photograph was taken? What, uh, what would you what would you say when when this picture was taken based on when your observations? I am going to pull up the chat and just see. So I see Danny and Josh uh, put fall. Yeah. So we can probably get some clues. Oh, and then Ria, mom says fall. Um, so yeah, so this picture would have been taken in the fall, and we can get those clues from lots of things. We can look at the trees and see the brown leaves. Um, we can see that some of the trees are bare. We can see if you know anything about um, the timing of when deer have their young. Um, and you might know that if you see a spotted coat on a deer, that that's a baby, that that's a young deer. And so that might give you a hint that this um, picture was taken in the fall when this baby was probably looks a little older, but still young enough to have its fawn coat. So yes, and that's basically what phenology is. We use phenology all the time to, uh, to identify, um, you know, changes in the season. Oh, I, winter's coming or fall is coming or spring is near because we can feel these changes. We can see the changes in the plants and in our environment around us. And that gives us clues as to uh, what we can look forward to in those changes. 
Um, so how did we study this? How did we study these changes? Um, so we did um, qualitative observations, which is just a fancy science way of saying we looked at stuff and then wrote down what we saw. Um, so this is this particular program with uh, Florida International. This is an LTER which is a long-term ecological research project. They've been collecting data since the 1990s, which to me doesn't sound like that long ago, but for some people like, yeah, um, when they start referring it to the late 1900s, it hurts my heart a little bit. But um, so they have been collecting data for several decades um, in the same area, same several areas in Alaska. And that's a picture of me again with my blue raincoat. Um, taking qualitative observations in the field. And I'm standing on these railroad ties that mark off what's called phenology plots. And these phenology plots have been staked out for several decades and they've been watching them change over these decades. And we kept track of, we would go out twice a week and we would record um, when we would see the leaves um, budding, when we would see bud breaks, when the leaves were starting to break out of the buds, greening up, when we would see um, flowers um, budding and then uh, flowering, they also kept track of when fruits would appear on the different plants um, and just the overall greening of, of these plots. And of course we would track the time and the date um, which you can see in the right picture, that is one of our field um, pieces, uh, field records that we would take out with us because, um, you know, when you're in the field, you're no, we're not anywhere close to where technology would be reliable. Um, it's fairly isolated. Um, and, you know, you didn't want to take your devices out into the rain and into the weather and to the elements. And so a lot of the work was still done, you know, old school paper pencil. Um, and then we would come back and then input that data into a, a digital database. We also used, we did use some fancy <laughs> equipment. So the picture on the left is Dr. May setting up what's called the MISP, the MISP, which is the mobile instrument sensor um, platform. And this is really kind of the the key thing with Florida International and the work that they do in the tundra in Alaska um, is with this MISP. Um, it runs on this transect, runs on this uh, on these cables across a strip of ground. Um, we would run it every day, except for Sundays. And on this platform, they could put in different um, types of sensors that could collect all kinds of different data that are more quantitative. And so you see that the, the term has changed a little bit. That just means um, instead of just using my eyes and making a judgment about how green something is, we have technology that can take actual measurements and um, have a quantity to how green something is. Um, and they could track all kinds of different things. The idea for this though is unique to Florida International. Um, Dr. Oberbauer was thinking that, you know, we have people on the ground that are making these qualitative and quantitative observations um, about changes that are happening. And then we have satellites in space that are looking at the same places, but there's not really anything that's in between. Um, so you had, you know, boots on the ground, you're looking, you know, at a 10 centimeter square of, of plants and making your observations. And then you would have a satellite, you know, that's a mile above and looking at a mile, a kilometer square of, of tundra and, and making observations and collecting data. And the idea behind the MISP was to be this bridge between the measurements that could be taken um, by hand and on the ground and the measurements that are taken in satellites in space. And it was this, the scaling up of the, of this data that helped to, um, you know, it was like ground truth being the, um, 
what we were seeing on the ground, what we were seeing in space. We had this intermedi intermediary um, in between um, instrument that was helping us see that, confirming that what we were seeing on the ground, confirming the measurements in space and, and helping to keep those measurements and, and see the accuracy of that. Um, then we were also using, oh, I love that picture. That is the beautiful mountains in Alaska there, makes me miss them. Um, the little short plastic um, things are called OTCs. This is something else that Florida International uses. They're called, um, they're open top chambers. And think of them like little miniature greenhouses. And so this is an experiment that's been running for several decades, several years for sure. Um, and they have plots that they put these OTCs, these open top chambers to help simulate um, a warmer uh, tundra. And then they can compare how the plants are changing in the OTCs versus just the regular tundra plots, open, just regular, the control plots that were nearby um, to see how much the, um, you know, temperature warming by one or two degrees, how much of a difference that would make to the plants as, as far as when they were getting green or when they would put on fruit or flowers or when they would go into what's called senescence, when they change their colors in the fall and get ready to overwinter. Um, we also used the green seeker. This is something that's used by some farmers. Um, they can use it to determine if they need to fertilize a crop. If their crop is green, then they know that it's healthy and it's, it's doing well. Um, if it's not a certain greenness, then they can add some fertilizer to make it healthier. And that's the idea behind green seeker. Um, because my idea of what green is, may not be the same idea as somebody else's green. So this actually puts a number to the greenness of a plant. We can measure how green a plant is using a um, instrument like the green seeker. Um, and then there's a picture of me on the right where I am taking permafrost depths. That was another um, environmental factor that we were tracking. And so you just simply put that metal stake into the ground and until it hit permafrost and permafrost is this permanently frozen soil. It never, ever thaws. So it's like hitting a, a rock, a layer of rock underneath. So we would go out every time we went to the phenology plots, we would track the, um, the permafrost melt as well in several places in the plot. You would put the, the, probe into the ground and then you would measure just simply with a ruler um, how many centimeters deep did that probe go into the ground before it hit permafrost. Um, so the other part of that title of the phenology and vegetation change in the warming ar arctic, vegetation change is, is slightly different. So phenology is the timing of when the plants were doing their um, greening up, when they were um, I'm going to speed up a little bit <laughs> when they would green up, when they would um, go into senescence or um, change colors in the fall. But vegetation change is the change of species dominance. What types of plants are um, more dominant or less dominant in the Arctic? And so this is a picture of a birch tree. Um, and you might have birch trees where you live, but they probably don't look like this. They are very small in the Arctic. This is Betula nana, which is the botanical name for um, this particular species of birch. And it's about the size of a bush, you know, maybe knee to waist high. Um, but as the Arctic is warming, some of the shifts, um, the dominance has changed. With the warming Arctic, the permafrost is melting, which means plant roots can go deeper before they hit the frozen ground. Um, and deeper roots means that the plants can grow taller. And there's also a longer growing season. It's getting warmer earlier and staying warmer later. So the plants can grow more um, during their growing season. So we have um, this vegetation change. Um, in the, in this plant, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, these shrubs are just getting taller and taller and taller, which means they're providing more shade. And um, that led them to the shade plots, which um, is on the right here. And I just put, that was my flat cat where the wild cats here in Piedmont. And so I took flat cat with me um, and uh, hid him in posts and things like that. So this is some shade cloth. So flat, flat cat's about, oh, roughly six inches um, just for size reference. So these are very small plots that they used shade cloth. That black stuff is just a cloth to, pro to create um, artificial shade and they had varying, this is an HS, you see a little HS on the flag, that's a high shade plot. They had low shade and then no shade plots. And then they were tracking to see, well, how do plants do in shaded areas? And the best way to explain, you know, environmental changes with climate change is that, you know, there's just winners and losers in an environment. And when the um, climate is changing, you know, the birch shrubs become taller, providing more shade. And that's good for some plants and terrible for others. Um, and then it's just this domino effect since um, all ecosystems are based off of plants, you know, animals eat plants and then other animals eat plants that eat, eat the animals that eat plants and animals. And so um, you have this domino effect, this ripple effect of when the plants change in their dominance and what food is available that has this um, ripple effect throughout the entire environment, since plants are the basis of food chains. Um, so where did we go? So just a little frame of reference. Um, this, uh, we were in Alaska. Um, I'm in Oklahoma, that little black dot there in the center, right in the middle of the state. Um, we, I was in two locations. The star at the top is Utkiavik, which is otherwise known as um, Barrow, Alaska. Um, and then the star at the, the bottom, the, the bottom star there is uh, Tulik Field Station. So I, I was in two, both of those locations. Um, Utkiavik is, um, a town of about 5,000 people right on the Arctic coast. And they have a, a, an ecology that is coastal tundra. So slightly different than um, the, the tundra that was a little further inland um, in the same way that you would see different types of plants and animals in a coastal region versus a more inland region. Um, unfortunately, when I got to um, Utgiavik, it was, they had just had a big snow, even though it was June. Um, so the, the tower that you can see in the picture on the left is typically quite a bit taller. Um, we would be standing at the base of that tower and it would be another good five or six feet um, above us. So there's probably about five or six feet of snow in, in, on the ground there um, that of course we dug out to secure the towers again for the, get them ready for the um, season uh, when we arrived. Um, luckily though, and in a way it was kind of lucky that there was snow because the, um, the field research area was uh, about a mile out from, you know, our, our headquarters, our home base at the bark. And, um, so we had to carry heavy equipment out to the, uh, field sites, but with the snow, we could take dog sleds, which were pulled by, um, a, uh, snow machine in this case, no dogs, unfortunately, that would have been so much fun. But once we unloaded the dog sled, it was too light. Um, it would have just flopped around behind the snow machine. So somebody had to ride it back to, uh, the research station. So, um, I volunteered with my GoPro and you can see it's just a lot of white, <laughs> white snow, white sky, um, it's very easy to get disoriented and lost. And I apologize if that's making you a little seasick. Um, but uh, that was such a wonderful experience to get to, to do that. Um, Tulik is further south. Um, and it's a field research station. So Utkiavik is a town full of wonderful culture and um, 
the Inupiaq people are uh, the majority of the people that live in, in Utkiavik and they're just a lovely people. So I got to experience um, Alaska culture um, because Tulik Field Station is just a little town off of the Dalton Highway. It's uh, nine miles north, or nine hours, excuse me, nine hours north of Fairbanks and six hours south of Dead Horse on the Dalton Highway. So it's extremely isolated. Um, those are weather ports. That's where we would live. Um, and we had, you know, a really nice chef that cooked food for us. Our food was just fantastic. Um, we worked six days a week, but this was what our view looked like in the tundra. A lot of people always think of it being snowy, but in the summertime, 24 hours of daylight, it gets very green, very fast. Um, here is a picture of Tulik Field Station. You can see it off in the distance. It's next to a lake called Tulik Lake. So um, it's just like a little miniature town. Um, just a very, it's just a science town. That's, that's, that's all that lives there in various seasons. Um, so there's another picture, a closer uh, picture. These are bigger OTCs, uh, open top chambers. Um, this was in between um, sleet squalls that <laughs> were pelting us in between. Um, uh, trying to set these up for the beginning of the season. So I arrived at the beginning of a season. Um, so I did a lot of setting up of equipment and moving things. But on Sundays, we would go for hikes. Um, that was the day off that you had where we didn't have to go out into the field and we didn't have to take measurements. And so we would hike Adigan. This is Adigan Pass. So you can see how green and beautiful it can be in the summertime. Um, we always think of it being cold and snowy and dreary, but it is absolutely, it's just such a beautiful place. Um, that's the top of Slope Mountain. And there's a base of Slope Mountain picture there. So you can see again in the pictures just how quickly it greens up. This is about a month later, um, going from snow covered to this green um, in just roughly 25 days, I think. And then of course, everyone wants to know when you're out in the field, how do you go to the bathroom? Um, we use the towers, which are just basically permanent outhouses, but notice that it's built up because you can't dig down um, to build um, an outhouse. Um, the towers, you would go up a flight of stairs use the restroom and then a truck would come and pump the tanks below, um, but you can't dig down due to the permafrost. Um, it's only a few inches of soft ground and only in the summer. And then uh, we had showers and uh, facilities like that, um, that we could uh, to use as well, but you could only shower. You got four minutes of shower time a week that you could use any way you wanted to. Um, so <laughs> use them wisely. Um, so that's the end of that presentation that I have. I'm going to stop sharing and see if we have questions. I... Oh, that's the wrong set of tabs. Let's see. Here we go. Oh my goodness. So many questions. Um, so first question is as a chemistry teacher, have you ever done a class experiment involving climate change? Um, not a class experiment, but my first unit of the year, we um, looked at thermodynamics, um, which is a key concept in chemistry, um, how um, heat energy moves in a system. And we specifically looked at the Illisat Glacier in Greenland and how its rate of melt was affecting um, sea level rise. And so we just applied uh, thermodynamics to that glacier system and explaining um, the glacier system and its melting rate um, with that. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's a little bit tougher. I know my next, this semester, I plan on doing ocean acidification. Um, so we'll talk about that um, and use the phenomenon of oyster, oyster shells thinning as, as our uh, jumping off point. So yes, I, I do talk about climate change, but I don't really do specific experiments, but we do learn about how chemistry plays a role in climate change. 
Uh, let's see. Will areas that are currently cold, examples Canada and Russia, become warm and therefore temperate and arable? Um, yeah, that's really difficult to predict because, again, um, we're in new territory as humans. We don't really know what um, is going to happen to these ecosystems when um, when the temperature continues to rise. Um, it's it's difficult to predict. Um, Canada and Russia and Alaska, this, these areas with permafrost are basically frozen swamps. And so when they thaw, um, what kind of uh, environment, what kind of uh, climate will they have? It's, it's difficult to predict, um, but it would definitely be warmer than it is now. Um, and there are it's just such a complex system, but yeah, I, I would assume that they would become warmer, but I don't know about becoming temperate. Um, I would believe that their um, fall and springs, they would have longer seasons. Um, right now they have very short summers, very short intense summers and extremely long and brutal winters with very fast springs and falls in between. So I would assume that they would in a way become more temperate because those seasons would um, start to expand and the winters would become shorter. Um, how long did it take you to get used to the 24 hours a day of sunlight? Did you have issues sleeping? Yeah, um, it didn't take too long. Um, you had to get used to, you know, you're used to watching the sun, you know, moving an arc across the sky, you know, rises in the east and it sets in the west. But um, when you're at the pole, it moves in a circle. And so um, it's noon when it's at the south and it's midnight when it's north. Um, and it just kind of moves in a circle. So it did take a little bit of time, about a week or two, to get to where I could judge time of day based on the sunlight um, and the placement of the sun. Um, sleeping, um, I took a sleep mask. Um, and then they have blackout curtains in your um, rooms where you slept. And so that did help quite a bit. Um, so yeah, the sleep mask was, was my best friend. Um, I don't know. I'm a good sleeper <laughs> and typically you worked so hard during the day, um, and hiking and, and going, uh, to the field and back. I mean, there was just a lot of, a lot of physical, um, labor, uh, involved in, field work, which is fantastic because you definitely didn't have trouble sleeping because you would just be so tired at the end of the day. Um, Philip would like to know, is there an average green that plant should be? Well, it depends on the species of the plant. Um, the green index is called NDVI, which is a normalized, whatever the D stands for, I can't remember, index uh, vegetation. And um, it's a small scale, I wanna think, oh, I wanna say it goes from zero to five, I think, and five being the greenest, zero being the, the least amount of green in DVI. I can figure that out real quick. Um, normalized difference vegetation. Um, so, oh gosh, even less. So it's a negative one to a positive one. So negative one being not green to a positive one being as green as possible. Um, so my measurements would have been in the decimals. I forgot about that. So yeah. Um, Ideally, I guess plus one would be the ideal most green that a plant could be. But again, it depends on the species. Um, some plants, if they're shade plants, they're going to be not as green because they don't need that uh, chlorophyll. And then other plants that are more um, out in the sun are going to be greener than others. So, but um, I would think that the average, if I remember right, because it's been since 2018 the average green was running anywhere from 0.7, it's like seven to eight on that scale, 0.7 to 0.8. Um, oh, how many different plants, types of plants did you track in the field? Eight specific plants. <laughs> there were eight focus species. Um, so the uh, focus species were a range of different types of plants. There were evergreen plants like, um, oh man. I could rattle these off until I was put on the spot. Um, there were plants that were evergreen um, the, that stayed green year round. Um, think of like just miniature sized little 
green plants. Um, we had um, some shrubs, which were the equivalent of what trees would be in the lower latitudes. Um, because again, plants don't grow very tall in the tundra. They stay very short. Um, life is hard up there. And so closer to the ground is better survival for them. Um, they can't grow very deep root systems, which is what they would need to stabilize to grow up. So um, you have very short plants for the most part. And then you would have plants that were more, um, they would go through uh, not evergreen, but they would have, um, you know, the, the different, you know, obviously phenology changes, but these were eight key species um, in, in the tundra that they have been tracking for several decades. Um, when you were in Alaska, how was the weather? Was it warmer than normal? Um, again, when I was there, the first 11 days that I was there, it snowed almost every day. Um, and I was there from June, roughly the beginning of June, I'd say the June 4th to July 6th. Um, so I was there for a little over a month. Um, once it got to being with the more typical, um, what was a typical summer field season weather, it was running about uh, mid fifties to lower sixties um, temperature wise. Um, but so I was there in 2018, which was kind of a fluke year. Um, just, it was colder than normal, um, which means I, meant, I missed out on all of the mosquitoes, <laughs> which I was happy to do that. They have a ton of mosquitoes in Alaska, which people don't think about. Um, but if you think about it being like a frozen swamp, it does kind of make sense. Um, but yeah, I missed all of the mosquitoes because it was cold a little bit longer and, uh, then they didn't come out until after I was gone. So, um, but it was a little, I, I can't compare it. Um, but if, when I talked to some of the natives that lived in Utkjavik, um, they did talk more about the, um, inconsistencies in the sea ice that they depend on for whale hunts, um, that uh, portions of their town uh, being washed out into the ocean. Um, so the people that live there would say that the climate is definitely changing. Um, unfortunately for humans, it doesn't take us long to adjust to our new normal. So um, we kind of tend to forget very quickly if there's been changes in, in our climate, um, because we just have such a short memory for that. Um, what impacts do the changes in vegetation have on the animals in Alaska? That's an amazing question because the animals in Alaska are very migratory. Um, very few will stay in one place. And so they depend on different plants being green at certain times as they're moving through their migratory patterns. And so if their migratory patterns are um, not aligning with when um, plants are at their greenest, when there's fruits available, when they when plants uh, put on fruit, um, that can greatly impact um, animals like the caribou, um, hibernation patterns of species like bear, because they just depend on that to be green at a certain time. And so um, the Florida International shares their data with other researchers. And so when I was up there, there was a, a group there that were studying um, the nutrition of plants for the caribou. And um, they're starting to notice a change in caribou migration patterns. They are able to make those adaptations, but it, is make thing, it does make things difficult. Um, there's not a lot of biodiversity. There's not a lot of different types of plants and animals that can survive in such a um, ecosystem. And so when one plant or one animal um, goes through major changes, it doesn't take a whole lot to change um, everything else that is dependent on that, that comes, fans out from that. Um, so I think what they're starting to notice is um, mainly the changes in the migratory patterns and the timing of the migratory patterns of, of the animals. Rhea's mom would like to know, have you seen any invasive species as a result of climate change in Alaska at your field site? So that was a question I actually had um, 
you know, when I was working with the team and it hasn't been so much invasive species, there's been a few, um, but again, it's such a harsh climate. There's not a lot of plants that can come in <laughs> and survive and thrive in that planet, uh, that particular climate. Um, but what is changing is the species dominance. And so, um, you know, things like the birch, the, the betula that are typically shorter shrubs, if they're getting taller, that's changing that dynamic of how plants are interacting with each other. And so it's not so much a uh, an invasive species, it's more of a, a shift in dominance of species um, that is changing how other plants are able to survive. Um, the, what kinds of animals did you see other than birds? Um, oh, and there's so many birds in the summer, guys, where do you think they go? Right. You know, we always hear about birds migrating to the north in the summer and then they come south for the winter. A lot of them go to Alaska to um, to breed and have their broods. And so there's a ton. It's like it's a perfect it's an amazing place to go for bird watching. Um, but I got to see a lot of different types of wildlife. Um, I saw a polar bear. I did see a polar bear. Luckily, it was two miles off onto the sea ice, but I did see a polar bear. Um, Oh, all types of little rodents like voles, um, muskox, um, grizzly bear, and uh, brown bear. Um, let's see, goodness, what else? Oh, um, doll sheep, D A H L, doll sheep, um, mountain, they live up in the mountains. Um, lots of ground squirrels, Arctic ground squirrels. Um, foxes, Arctic foxes and red foxes. So um, there was, there's quite a bit of wildlife uh, that I did get to see while I was up there. Um, and what kind of rocks did you see? Um, I am not a geology person. Um, I don't, I don't really know the names of rocks. It's a very, um, the mountain ranges in that part of Alaska are, um, right along a fault line. And so these are growing new mountains. And so um, a lot of granite, um, shale or slate. I'm pretty sure it was shale. I don't know. <laughs> it was black and it was, you know, cleave very cleanly and flat. So, um, and I would assume it would be shale. Um, makes mountain climbing extremely, makes hiking very difficult when the rocks just like slide off the side of the mountain. But in, uh, one of the pictures, I don't know if I can share it again real fast, if I can find it, you can tell that the mountains kind of this black, um, black color, and it's because of that shale. So you can see um, Attigan is a good example of it. Well, oh dear, um, not so much, but you can see it's kind of a kind of dark gray. There's a lot of um, this dark black slate shale color. Um, rock. Um, I found a piece of coal just lying on the surface. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. Now I can't figure out. Stop share. There it is. Um, so yeah, I'm not, um, not much of a, a, a rock person, but I know for sure those two things, shale, I did like, I have a piece of coal and, um, yeah, and some granite from, you can see in the mountaintops as well. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was really great. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. It was, I hope you all had fun. I know I did. And I really enjoyed your talk again, Melissa. So thank you once again for taking the time and speaking here for us. Yes. And for the rest of our audience members, um, don't forget to mark your calendars for our next event, uh, which will be our Ask a Geologist web series. And the topic this time will be energy storage materials. We will have uh, Jessica Johnson. Um, she will be speaking about renewable energies and fossil fuels and how energy is generated from these sources. So don't forget to mark your calendars for, um, it's going to be on February 17th and it will begin at 6 p.m. Um, so once again, don't forget to join us for that event. And thank you once again, Melissa, and uh, good night to everybody. Thank you.